She is co-founder of 9-11 Families for a Safe and Strong America and Keep America Safe. Um, Deborah, always great to talk to you. Thank you, Steve. It's good to be with you today. All right. I, I, I know that um, that you're not happy. I, I don't think a lot of us are happy. Uh, but, you know, you being in your un- unfortunately unique position and you who have just uh, done such great work in the aftermath of the attacks on 9-11, and I always said your brother is always looking down on you and, and is so proud. I mean, this just seems like a mess. Nobody has a story straight. Nobody's coming forward and saying, you know, what they know. Or, and if it, they are, it's contradicting with what other senators or people People have been told, and it just seems like here we go again. It does, um, but in some ways, it's it's actually worse than before 9/11 because before 9/11, what you had was what they call stovepiping failure to share. In other words, um, the CIA didn't want to give up to the FBI what they knew because they didn't want the FBI to interfere or disrupt uh, whatever investigations they had going on. They didn't want to share intelligence. And vice versa, the FBI, you know, there was a lot of um, institutional rivalry going on there. And of course, you know, there are 15 intelligence agencies um, in the United States, uh, the DIA, the NSA, the, I mean, the, the, um, all, each branch of the military. And, um, and then there are um, subsets of all those intelligence groups. And of course, we had the 9-11 Commission. We had uh, the decision to create the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, Intelligence. This was the guy or gal who was supposed to be the, the so-called quarterback and amass all of this in one location and, and um, have it all come there and coordinate so everybody would know what everybody else was doing. And that, um, you know, was uh, people were divided on whether or not that was a good idea. Uh, it's turned out that it um, that the naysayers are right. It's created another huge bureaucracy. But let's get back to the the trouble within the for me the the FBI story, uh, because now you have, uh, in addition to the DNI, you have a new department with uh, I think 288 agencies, um, 88 uh, different um, uh, entities that 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 answer to it. This massive d- uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, where you have Janet Napolitano saying one thing one day. Remember the the underwear bomber, um, the system worked? Remember her statement? Right, right absolutely, after? yeah. And it turns out that it was an absolute catastrophe, an embarrassing muddle. We had the father of this extremist walk into a consulate in, in, in Niger and say, or Nigeria and say, I believe my son is a terrorist. He's in Yemen now. He's radicalized. Uh, and he has a U.S. visa. Um, that right there, um, they, they can't get the information to the people who can do something about it. And they don't even have a process for going into a computer somewhere and pulling his visa. So my problem, my worry here is that, you know, on 9-11 you had, uh, you remember two and a half weeks before the actual attacks, you had an arrest of, um, Zacharias Massawi, um, and you had... FBI agents in Minnesota where he was arrested desperately trying to get a, a search warrant. They weren't even trying to get a, um, a, a, a FISA warrant on this guy. They, 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 they were discussing whether or not to go and get um, a, 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 an ordinary search warrant. Um, they, or, or excuse me, they, they applied for a FISA warrant. They never applied for an ordinary search warrant. And they were turned down, and they were they were actually uh, reached out to the government of France to see if they could get intel from them to beef up their their application to the FISA court. And the the thing that makes this so troubling is that when you know all the investigations that followed after 9/11, what we found out is the FISA court had been very very strict on these warrants because of what was called the wall and how high the level of of um, uh, probable cause, uh, or the equivalent of probable cause, had to be uh, to get one of these warrants. Remember, this it didn't rise to the level of actual probable cause. It was lower. And I hope I'm sorry if I'm getting too technical. No, 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 no. That's sorry. It, it, it was a lower level of a, a lower standard to get a FISA warrant. And FBI agents who went into this court looking for these FISA warrants, these Article Three uh, FISA FISA warrants, were scolded by the court. One FBI agent. Uh, was told by a judge, you are banned from this court um, permanently for the rest of your career because 
what you've applied in a, in a particular warrant um, is, is so embarrassingly lacking. And so FBI agents were afraid to apply for FISA warrants to have it somehow uh, get marked in their in their right right if they, they didn't know what kind of judge they'd be running up against so they didn't know how they'd be uh, reprimanded in a sense yeah. uh, for trying to do their job and that and that that's a problem and and, and also Deborah and we're talking to Deborah Burlingame here on the Steve Malzberg show um, CNN has reported today that um, the uh, older brother was on two his name was in two databases but not on any uh, kind of terrorist or other watch list. So I, you well, know, I, I, we, we, again, another another revelation that comes out well, of nowhere. I, I, I'm hearing different than that, but I just want to finish this one thought. The, the whole, what all I just said means is that FBI agents were risk averse, um, and I, what I, when I heard the Boston story and all the revelations that have come out since then. I now believe that FBI agents are risk averse in a different way, and it has to do with radical Islam. We've now been treated for the last several days to the media at pains, at pains not to speculate that the, these bombers had anything to do with um, radicalism associated with a certain area of the country or religious. They don't want to say Muslim, uh, Muslim terrorists. They don't want to say um, radical Islamists. Um, and now you, you know, we've learned, we've had members of Congress, uh, Michelle Bachman just yesterday, um, talking about how um, our intelligence agencies and our law enforcement agencies, federal, have been purged, scrubbed uh, in terms of their training manuals and their, and their operating procedures of, of the terms Muslim terrorist or Islamic radicals. And anyone who is a hardliner at the FBI um, who, who trains using those terms um, is going to get uh, it's going to hurt their career if not ha having them, you know, sent to some um, uh, outback in the, in the federal system where they well where they'll never be heard from again or fired. And um, so m what I'm afraid of here is here you had a guy who was uh, uh, known to be uh, get, get religion. I think in 2008 he became very religious in 2009. In 2010 he didn't even have a job anywhere. For, for that entire period. So what's he doing uh, in his home for, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis other than boxing? Um, he's going to the mosque five times a day. Um, you have a, a foreign government, normally not a friendly, but when it comes to Chechnya and the Caucasus where all this terrorism is going on, they take that very seriously. And um, basically um, asking the FBI to vet this guy, the FBI should have taken that very, very seriously. I don't know what they did. But clearly, um, this guy uh, came back from his visit to um, a terrorist area of Russia. Uh, I believe, yes, Dagestan uh, and Chechnya are the two areas where this group, Amarat uh, Kavkos, a terrorist group, um, is basically in control. D uh, Dagestan, where he was, um, it's a very poor, poor um, area of Russia where the, the only thing going on there is is crime and terrorism. Right. So what, this is not exactly a, where tourists no, go. No, and, and he and, comes and, back from that trip with a full beard, and now he's posting terrorist videos uh, on a YouTube channel. And, and also, uh, Deborah talking about uh, you know what we should have learned here. He uh, uh, he worshipped at the Islamic Society of Boston, which right. uh, has been uh, Fox News reported today a lightning rod for criticism. All kinds of questions about uh, that mosque and uh, in the media today. And also, I want you to hear uh, his mother. I want you to listen to his mother. Uh, what she had to say in in Russia today. This is cut thirty two. They're gonna kill him. They're gonna kill him. I don't care. My my oldest one is killed, so I don't care. I don't care if my youngest one is gonna be killed today. So I want the world to hear this, and I don't care if I I am gonna get killed too. Okay? And I will say Allahu Akbar. Okay, so she will say Allah Akbar. Now, I mean, <laughs> you know, if it quacks and walks and uh, swims like one, I, I guess it's a duck. Well, you know what I would say is um, I, I met a, um, a, a cab driver. I had a long conversation with him I've been in for a very long time who said he's been in this country for 25 years. He's raised four of his children in America. He loves this country. And he's, he lives in Queens. And he said, you know, 
Uh, you can't find a, a, a mosque in Queens that doesn't have a radical fire-breathing imam. He said, I tell my children to go in there and get out, okay? So I, my problem is this. The FBI, um, the, Ray Kelly in New York City has been hugely criticized for monitoring mosques in the metropolitan area. They don't go in there and do anything aggressive. They just listen. They just watch. And he's been criticized for that. So you say the I, FBI should learn from Ray Kelly and what he does? I do not believe, and you know, this may be just um, wanton speculation, but it's kind of hard for me to believe that with all this evidence about this guy and asked to be vetted um, by a foreign government uh, that has a problem with radicals, that you would have a Boston bombing uh, in New York City. You know, what Ray Kelly does, he doesn't, he, when he has a mass public event, um, he creates what's called a frozen zone around blocks and blocks of the city. And inside that zone, you're not allowed to bring a backpack. You are not allowed to bring a, a backpack or a, um, or a big heavy bag. And, and the garbage cans are seal taken away or sealed up. The mailboxes are sealed up. They, they, right. go, they got everything down past. So I got about a minute left, uh, Deborah. So, I mean, so here you're saying that the, the lack of communication and the lack of, uh, of persistence on the part of the FBI, for whatever reason, could be worse now than 9-11. And you think that they need to take a lesson uh, from Ray Kelly and how things are done here in New York, correct? I, I think political correctness when it comes to radical Muslims is dangerous and cruel. It's cruel to the victims. And especially after the bombings happened, how this guy uh, wasn't revisited. I mean, they, how many terrorist suspects do you think they have in the city of Boston? On the Tides list, apparently he was on it. Only 5% on that list are um, American residents or legal residents, or citizens or legal residents. So how many of them could have been in Boston? Right. So I say they could have stopped this Maybe they could have stopped it, but they certainly should have. Chris Collier, that police officer, should be alive. They should have hunted these guys down. And the younger brother was tweeting and hanging out in his at his apartment. Yeah. All right, Deborah. So it, it, it I is, can't believe they couldn't find these guys. I, I, I never understood why, based on the fact that they talked to him, that he wasn't on some computer list where right after it happened, he would have been one of the first that they went, went to look for. I don't get that either. But listen, Deborah, thank you. As always, God bless you. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you for being there. Okay. Deborah Burlingame, ladies and gentlemen.